All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, can everybody hear me? What? You got me. All right. Um, my name is Jeff Harris. I'm a forester with the Illinois DNR. And I'm going to be talking today about regenerating oak in the upper Midwest. So, you know, when you've got an, a mature, over mature oak over story, you know, what are you going to do to make sure that you, after a harvest, have regenerated that stand back to oak, if that's your goal? And I'm really going to be talking mostly about re naturally regenerating that stand back to oak. I'm not going to go so much into artificial planting. So we're really just going to be talking about naturally regenerating stands to oak. And so in order to regenerate a stand uh, of oak back to oak, you have to employ the right civicultural technique. But what is civiculture? Civiculture is the art and science of growing trees. It's what it means to be a forester. Uh, producing, growing, and tending to the forest. But foresters did not invent civiculture. We're really just imitating natural processes that already happen in nature. Um, nature will regenerate stands of timber naturally by itself uh, through, by means of, fire, insect and disease outbreak, wind throw, ice storms, etc. So foresters are just imitating these natural disturbances, albeit in a more controlled manner, uh, in, in order to enable, to ensure that you get the desired outcome. And so before we get into the different civicultural techniques, I want to um, review quickly important tree characteristics. Um, particularly the, the tolerance of different species to shade. And so you can see all the trees uh, listed down the left side are trees that you'd commonly find in the area. And we're going to talk about their, their tolerance to shade. Aspen is a very fast growing species. It's referred to as a pioneer species. It's usually it can be the first on site after a big disturbance. It's very shade intolerant, needs lots of sunlight, it's short-lived. Um, oaks are, for all intents and purposes, they're shade intolerant as well. Red oak more so than white oak. White oak is listed as intermediately shade tolerant, but really all that means is it can withstand a little bit of shade for a certain amount of time, but ultimately even white oak needs lots of sunlight to continue its development and recruit upward into a co-dominant or dominant position within the tree canopy. Uh, maple and basswood are quite the opposite. They're, they're shade tolerant. Maple is very shade tolerant. So it doesn't have any problem hanging out in the understory for years and years. It might be hanging out in the shaded understory of a closed canopy forest for 60, 80 plus years, just waiting for that time when there's a disturbance in the canopy and it can, again, recruit upward. And so, uh, civicultural treatments are broken, uh, broken down into two different groups. Uh, regeneration cuttings and intermediate cuttings. But uh, the difference is Regeneration cuttings are done to reproduce or regenerate a forest. Intermediate cuttings are done in immature stands uh, to uh, improve health and vigor and to uh, sort of manipulate the species composition the way you want that immature stand to be. But we're going to focus today on regeneration cuttings because we want to begin to understand what civicultural technique do I employ if I want to regenerate oak? Conversely, which techniques do I stay away from if I want to regenerate oak? And so regeneration cuttings can be further broken down into um, 
uneven aged management systems, and even aged management systems. Uneven aged management systems uh, include single tree selection harvests or group selection harvests. And let's use single tree selection as an example. You might have 20 acres of timber and you decide to harvest 20 high value walnuts out of, the, out of that 20 acres. So you haven't really created much of a canopy disturbance. You know, you've, you've plucked a tree here and there from that stand, but you haven't done a lot to disturb the canopy. So uneven aged management systems are not going to favor oak. Oak need big disturbance. They need lots of sunlight, right? So the even aged management system systems are going to favor oak because you might uh, remove acres and acres of continuous forest cover. Now you've got full sunlight at the forest floor and the oak are ready and poised to take off after a disturbance like that. And so this is just a picture of an uneven aged forest versus an even aged forest. An uneven aged forest is going to have at least three age classes in that stand. And typically in an uneven aged forest, you're going to have a lot of small trees and not as many large trees. And again, that uneven aged management system is going to favor shade tolerant trees. Uh, you know, these, these little guys are hanging out in the understory of a closed canopy forest. They've got to be shade tolerant if they're going to hang on. Oak, if it was hanging out down here, would wither and die in, in the shade. This is an even aged forest. And what that means is, you know, mostly all those trees are about the same age. If this was an 80 year old forest, they'd probably all be between 65 and 90 years old. They're all roughly the same size, same height. Uh, and this really favors oak. This is, you know, you get an even aged forest after a big disturbance. Um, they grow up together as a single cohort and all the trees and that even age stand have equal access to sunlight, right? Equal opportunity at the sun. And that's what they need, that's what oak needs to keep recruiting upward, to make it someday to be a, a, you know, a co-dominant or dominant tree. But, you know, there's two age stands that it falls in between, but we'll just focus on the even age stand for now. And for it to be truly an even age, aged stand at maturity, you'd have to have um, managed it throughout. And, you know, Native Americans were great land managers. They pretty much managed even aged forests because they were routinely burning, all right? So you had widely spaced large oak trees and not much going on in the understory because they were routinely burning and knocking that regeneration back. Um, or, you know, today we could burn or we could come in and uh, mechanically treat any undesirable regeneration coming in underneath of that even aged forest. So even aged management systems are broken down into clear cuts, seed tree harvests, and shelter wood systems. And so we'll get a little more in depth with each of those. Clear cutting, uh, in, in a clear cut, you're going to har harvest all of the merchantable trees. Put a little money in your pocket. Whatever the log buyer wouldn't take, you're going to have to kill, intentionally kill it and fell it to the ground. And that's going to be any tree that's two inches in diameter and larger. You know, if the log buyer didn't take it, you've got to kill them. And a clear cut should be two, uh, two acres in size or larger. You know, anything smaller, you're going to get uh, this edge shading effect and it won't really work the way you want it to. There's going to be so much shading going on, you're not going to stimulate that oak regeneration. So it's got to be two acres in size or larger. And in a, in a clear cut, you're counting on, you know, uh, that next even aged oak forest to regenerate from what else? The acorns, right? So you need to time this clear cut with a heavy seed crop. If you don't do that, you'll have a failed clear cut. So be patient. When you're planning a clear cut, uh, wait for that heavy seed crop year and then strike. And you know, with oak, you might get a heavy seed crop 
every four to six years. With the climate changing, it's a little more unreliable, but you've got to be um, adaptive when you're going to do a clear cut. So, uh, clear cutting is done to regenerate species that need full sunlight for, germina for germination and seedling development. That's oak, right? That's what we're talking about. And it's done to produce even age stands uh, which favor oak because, like I said, all in an even age stand, all the oak are recruiting upward at the same time as a single cohort and they all get equal access to sunlight. And that's what we need. And th uh, this is a, uh, a picture of a clear cut uh, in oak forest in Ohio. It was done in the spring of 2001. It was a 15 acre clear cut. And you can see a hundred just 120 days later, that site has already flushed out. It's flushed out with new oak seedlings because they timed it with a heavy seed crop. Um, it's flushed out with stump sprouts from those oak trees that were cut off. You know, oaks will vig vigorously re-sprout after being cut off at the ground, right? But having said that, if you've got an overmature 28 inch diameter oak and you harvest it, it probably isn't going to re-sprout, but you know, an 18 inch, a 16 inch, a 14 inch, 12 inch diameter oak is going to re-sprout vigorously. So, uh, and also, there was some advanced oak regeneration here. So in the process of clear cutting, you were killing all trees two inches in diameter and larger, but you were leaving advanced oak regeneration. What is advanced oak regeneration? It's an oak sapling that's four to six foot tall, okay? And we're counting on those to be a part of that next even age stand as well. Uh, three years later, you've done your job. You've got an even aged oak forest beginning to develop over time, okay? But I will direct your attention back up to the top picture once again. Um, there are logs strategically placed about that clear cut and those are for roughed grouse males to drum on in the spring during the spring courtship. So with a clear cut, you can have fun with the wildlife too. You know, some animals, not, not all animals want old growth forests. Some of them need that flush of early successional forest. Uh, they, they like it, they need it. Um, the next system we'll talk about is, a seed, is the seed tree system. In, in a seed tree harvest, you're, you're going to mimic pretty closely what you did with the clear cut, except you're going to leave 10 to 15 widely spaced oak seed trees per acre. And you're counting on those seed trees to throw out seed and help reproduce that you know, next even aged stand of oak. Uh, you know, th there are some problems with the uh, seed tree system. One being that the log buyer might, it might not be worth his time to come back and harvest those seed trees afterward. And so you might be stuck with those seed trees and that's all right. You can leave them if, if need be. You can use them for firewood. You know, if you have a mill, you can mill them up. So, but there's, you got to be aware of that. It might not be worth his time to come back and get those seed trees. So you might be stuck with them. And so this is uh, just a, a diagram kind of visually breaking down the seed tree system. You, okay, this is the stand before the harvest. This is the stand at, right after the harvest. You've got 10 to 15 widely spaced oak trees per acre, right? Uh, those oak trees throw out seed and you get advanced oak regeneration. You know, you're starting to see oaks that are four, six foot tall. So you knock out those seed trees, harvest them. D, you did your job. You've got an even aged oak forest. All trees have equal opportunity at the sunlight. And so again, you know, disadvantages of the seed tree system, I kind of touched on one of them earlier, but when you harvest uh, that stand and you leave 10 to 15 widely spaced oak trees, they're suddenly uh, more prone to being wind thrown. So instead of 15, 10 to 15 widely spaced trees, you could do uh, small groups around. And that way they're a little more 
wind firm, a little more hardy when you know they're in a group helping to protect each other. Um, in a seed tree system, you could damage some of that oak, that advanced oak regeneration when you come back in to harvest those seed trees. But not a real big downside if you ask me, because if you damage an oak sapling, you can just cut it off at the ground line and it'll vig vigorously re-sprout. So really no harm, no foul. It'll be head high again by the end of the next growing season. Because again, oak have great underground root systems, right? So, and like I talked about earlier, landowners don't like leaving significant volumes of lumber in seed trees. They can get wind thrown. Maybe the logger doesn't want to come back and get them. So you might be money out that way. Uh, so things you just have to weigh. Okay, the uh, last one I'm going to talk about is the shelter wood system. And the shelter wood system, um, again, is going to uh, mimic pretty closely a clear cut. The difference is in a shelter wood system, you're going to use three stages to remove the overstory. So instead of clear cutting it all today, you're going to clear cut it in stages over time, and it could be 20 years. I mean, you're really stringing this out. So, you know, if you're a guy that doesn't want to look out your back window and see a clear cut, you can, this will be much more aesthetically pleasing. Okay, you're doing it in stages over time. Um, like I said, three cuts, we'll go over each of those. The first cut is the preparatory cut. In a preparatory cut, you're going to be removing damaged, defective trees. And the big thing in the preparatory cut is you're getting rid of all of those undesirable species. I mean, if you got maple and elm and hackberry, you're getting those out of there in that preparatory cut because you don't want them contributing to that next even age stand of oak. You want that seed source gone. And roughly after the preparatory cut, you've reduced your stocking to 70%. And you know, this isn't, whenever, if you, if you really were to apply this, it's not, you don't have to follow the textbook. You know, you can play with it a little bit. These are rough guidelines, okay? The, uh, the second cut is done several years later after you have a heavy seed crop. When you get that heavy seed crop, that same year or that same winter, you'd go in there and you'd remove, you'd, you'd remove more of those overstory oak trees and you'd bring the stocking down to thir between 30 and 60%. Now, the great thing about this is when the loggers are in there, their skitters are pulling logs and they're kicking up that duff layer, exposing bare mineral soil. And so those acorns are getting contact with the bare mineral soil and they need that to germinate. So it's a real big advantage to that. Um, and uh, the reason though, you're, you're really reducing that stocking from down to between 30 and 60% is, you know, those trees just threw out acorns. Now we're going to remove a significant portion of that oak overstory to increase light into the understory and stimulate that oak regeneration and stimulate that oak development, right? And then the final cut, you, you might be down to 30% stocking in the overstory at this point. The final cut is done maybe tw uh, five or 20 years down the road, but what you're waiting for is that oak regeneration to become advanced oak regeneration. You want it to be four or six foot tall. Then you can go in there and remove that final bit of overstory to fully um, open up that site, get full sunlight to your next even aged oak stand. And so this is just a, again, an illustration of that process. Uh, this is the forest before the shelter wood uh, system begins. In, the, in picture B, in this scenario, they actually combined the preparatory cut and the seed cut into one. And so you're already down to 30% stocking after the, the, the first cut. So here you see the uh, oak seedlings are starting to develop into advanced regeneration. And once they get you know, to four or six foot tall, you remove the remainder of those overstory trees and you've got an even aged oak forest developing 
And you know, as I've said in, again, or as I've said in the past, all these oak trees have equal access to sunlight, right? And that's very important. So yes, uh, shelter wood can be done in three stages. It can be done in two stages. It's really up to you how aggressive you want to be or how conservative you want to be. You and your forester can decide that. And so in summary, before we move on to the next topic, um, uneven aged management systems favor shade tolerant species like maple, right? Because you're going in there with a single tree selection harvest and you're, you're just plucking a tree here and there. You're not getting the canopy disturbance you need to increase light levels sufficiently in the understory to stimulate oak regeneration and development. So if you wanna regenerate oak, you gotta go with the even aged management system, okay? And that doesn't mean that if you've got 100 acres of timber that you need to clear cut the whole thing. You might decide you just wanna regenerate oak on five or 10 acres, okay? And I'll get into this more later, but if you're gonna do that, you wanna pick the poorest site on your property. You know, oak are gonna outcompete on poor sites better than they do on productive sites. Uh, you know, on a productive site, they're gonna have a hard time competing with maple and basswood. So if you're gonna regenerate oak, do it on the poorest site that you have. And the poor site gives the uh, competitive advantage to oak because you know, they're drought resistant. They, they stand up to poor conditions much better than you know, maple does, for instance. Okay, and so you know, in a selection tree harvest, you get these small canopy gaps here, okay? And don't let that fool you. You're not gonna get an oak to grow in that small opening. It's probably gonna close up very quickly. Those adjacent trees are gonna close that hole up rather quickly. And so you really haven't created a canopy disturbance at all here. You know, in the even aged management system, after that disturbance is over, you know, you look up and all you see is sky for, for a long time. And that's, that's what you need to see when you're trying to regenerate oak. So now I wanna switch gears and talk about some case studies or some land that I'm managing in Northwest Illinois and how I'm going about doing that. But first I want to cover a few forestry basics. Uh, what is basal area? Uh, basal area is um, the cross-sectional area of an individual tree trunk at breast height. It's measured at four and a half feet above the ground line. Um, and that cross-sectional area is expressed in square inches, okay? So you gotta convert that to square feet. So here's an example. You measure this oak tree, it's 12 inches in diameter. So you plug it into this formula here. Basal area equals 0 0.005454 times 12 squared. So this number here is called the Forester's constant. You're gonna use that number every time the only number that's gonna be different is whatever the diameter of that tree is, okay? So you, you do that calculation and you get 0 0.785376. That tree has uh, 0.785376 square feet of basal area. And so if you measure every tree in the stand, you can add up all those basal areas, divide it by the area that you were sampling and you can come up with uh, how much basal area you have in that stand, and it's gonna be expressed in square feet per acre most often. You know, how much basal area do I have in square feet per acre? Um, and so what you wanna start to understand here um, is that 60 square feet of basal area means that you could jam all of your trees in that acre into a six by 10 box, right? Put them, tap, pack them in tight, no air space in between them. If you've got 80 square feet per acre, you can jam all those trees in that acre into eight by 10 box. And if you have 120 square feet per acre, you guessed it, you can jam them all into a 10 by 12 box, pack them in tight, no air space in between them. But the point is, when you've got a mature 
forest, you really want your basal area, square feet per acre, to be somewhere between 60 and 80 square feet per acre. Because at that point, the trees, the, the remaining trees have a lot of room to grow. They're going to be growing vigorously, healthy. If you've got 120 square feet basal area per acre, the stand's way overstocked, the trees are stunted, they're stressed, and they're going to be prone to disease. So this is a stocking guide, okay? And this is what you're going to want to consult when you're thinning your stand, particularly if you employ a shelter wood harvest or the shelter wood system, you're, you know, you and or your forester should be looking at this stocking guide at some point to guide you, where, you know, where you start and where you need to be. But um, along the y-axis here, you see it's the basal area per acre. Along the x-axis, we have trees per acre. We're gonna, we'll get more into this later, but um, I'm just briefly introducing this stocking guide to you now. I'm going to have to jump down there and... Oh, that's... So with this stocking guide, and I'll give you an example later, but this A line up here is the average maximum density. So if your uh, stocking falls above this A line, you're overstocked, right? But if your stocking below, uh, falls in between the A and the B line, you're fully stocked. If you're up here, you're at the upper end of fully stocked. And if you're down here, you're at the lower end of fully stocked. This B line is the average minimum density, and I would refer to that as the woodland, the woodland line. You no longer, at this point, really have a forest, you have a woodland. Widely spaced trees, their canopies are just barely touching, or they're not widely spaced trees. Down here, you're understocked, and you're getting more toward savanna-like conditions, I, I, I suppose you could say. But it, it, you know, down here, you've got widely spaced trees. Lots of sunlight is getting to the forest floor between those trees. And that's important because during the shelterwood harvest, we're going to eventually work it down into here, right? Or maybe even below. So uh, I'm going to... I'm going to go over some properties that I'm actually managing here in Northwest Illinois. I call this the Rockford Stand because it's over near Rockford, Illinois. I uh, didn't want to put the landowner's name on it, of course. Um, and so I've got a, a, a description of that stand. It, uh, the dominant and co-dominant trees at that site are white and bur oak and they're 12 inches to 30 inches in diameter. That's the overstory. In the midstory, we've got elm and cherry, four inches to 12 inches in diameter. And you know, at the forest floor, the trees that are regenerating in this stand are elm, cherry, and hackberry. So we don't have any oak in the understory, and we really don't have any in the midstory. They're all in the overstory. But at this point in time, this forest is pretty much transitioned from, at one point, this was an even-aged forest, but it wasn't managed as an even-aged forest over time, so now we've got really an, even, uh, an uneven-aged forest, probably, you know, th three different age classes or more. But we are interested in, in regenerating this back to oak. So uh, in the shrub layer, We've got, we find that we have exotic invasive bush honeysuckle and buckthorn present. They're present in low volumes though at least. Uh, but you know, we, we'll hold on to that thought because we've got to deal with them, okay? And the site index here is 65 for red oak. What does that mean? Site index is a relative um, measure of site quality. 
So after 50 years, the red oak at this site are going to be 65 foot tall. So this is actually a pretty poor site. On a high quality site, the red oak should be 80 plus after 50 years. So this is a poor quality site. And like I said earlier, I'm targeting poor quality sites to regenerate oak because oak compete much better on poor soils than they do on productive soils. Let's leave the productive soils to the maple and the basswood and the walnut. But if we're going to regenerate oak, let's stick to those poor soils. And you know, around here, especially in the driftless area, you're going to find those poor soils on south and west facing side slope forests, okay? Because they're dry, they're exposed to the sun, and they usually have um, thinner soil lenses than the north and the east aspects do. So that's where we want to focus our efforts if we're going to regenerate oak. And so this is the stand level tree data table for that stand. And just to break it down a little bit more for you, make it a little easier to digest. Um, the species are listed here on the left. We've got 14 black cherry per acre on average. And it accounts for five square feet of basal area per acre. We've got two bur oak per acre, but those two bur oak account for uh, five square feet of basal area per acre. We've got 141 elm per acre, okay? So the elm are just going crazy in there. They need to be controlled. Uh, and they've got 25 square feet of basal area per acre. We've got 50 white oak per acre. Now this is, a, you know, this is a real stand. I'm not making any of this up. So this, this, I mean, it's a poor site. 50 oak per acre, it's perfect for the shelter wood system to regenerate oak. Uh, and, and that's 70 square feet of basal area per acre. So for our totals, we've got 207 trees per acre. We're going to use this later on when we look at that stocking chart again. We've got 207 trees per acre. We've got 105 square feet of basal area per acre at this, on, for this stand. So the forest management plan you know, sets forth the prescriptions for that stand to regenerate it to oak. And this is what the plan says. First things first, we're going to eradicate honeysuckle and buckthorn before we do anything else. Because if we manipulate the canopy and increase light into the understory, we're not going to be favoring oak. We're going to be favoring the honeysuckle and the buckthorn. We're going to get a honeysuckle buckthorn forest. We've got to deal with them first. Because even on a poor site, you know, po you know, the honeysuckle and buckthorn might outcompete the oak. You know, we just got to get rid of them first. After we do that, we're going to thin out the undesirable understory and midstory trees from the stand to include elm, cherry, hackberry, and we might even take out some of those poor formed oak from the overstory. This is like our preparatory cut, right? At this point, we are going to drop the stocking down to somewhere around 70% or less. Then, after a heavy seed crop, we're going to harvest a third or two thirds of that remaining oak overstory, and we're doing that for two reasons. We want to increase light into the understory and let that seed flourish. Let, those, let that seed germinate and those oak trees take off and develop. But we've got to get a lot of light in there, so we're going to remove a lot of that overstory. We're also doing it because in the course of that harvest, the skidder is going to be pulling those logs along. He's going to be kicking up that duff layer, exposing bare mineral soil, allowing for those acorns to germinate. Now, we only want to move on to that seed cut if we have adequate advanced oak regeneration. Um, if we don't, we could underplant, but uh, you know, for the sake of this conversation, we're just going to say we get that. You know, we get that; it's no big deal. But it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. If you, if you, if it's just not working out for you that you get adequate advanced oak regeneration, you could, underplanting with bare root seedlings, container trees, it is an option. But I would say for me, it's a last resort because natural regeneration is way better than planting in my book. Number one, you keep the genetics on site. And I think that's important because, you know, 
we've lost a lot of our woodlands. We used to have, what, 14 million acres. Now we've got 2 million acres. So the genetics, a lot of the genetics have been lost. And, you know, you've got a site. These trees have been there, you know, for hundreds, thousands of years. That genetic line's probably been on that site. And they're really adapted to the site conditions. You know, you bring a seedling in from a uh, nursery in Missouri. You don't know where it came from. It might not be well adapted to your site. And furthermore, the deer are going to hammer bare root seedlings more than they do natural regeneration. And I think it's because they can smell the nitrogen in the seedlings or something. Uh, it's tastier to them. But natural regeneration is going to fare much better against the deer. So anyway, so this is, again, we're back at that stocking chart. And remember, we had about 105 square feet of basal area per acre. And we had about a little over 200 trees per acre. So where those lines converge, that's the stocking for that stand. So this is at the upper end of a fully stocked stand. Um, after that preparatory cut, we brought the basal area down to about 70 square feet per acre. And you know somewhere between 50 and 60 trees per acre. Okay? So, Remember I said the preparatory cut is going to bring you down to 70% stocking? Well, this actually brought us probably down to uh, somewhere around 60% stocking. But I said, like I said, you know, it's not textbook. You can kind of mess with those numbers as you see fit, OK? Eventually, you know, after we get a good seed crop, we're going to take out an, a, a you know, a, a third or two thirds of the remaining oak overstory, and we're going to further reduce the basal area and the number of trees per acre in that in, in the overstory. And so the goals are to you know first remove the undesirable species and the exotic invasives because we want to increase light to the forest floor and stimulate oak regeneration and development, and we want to begin the process of creating an even aged forest because eventually we got to do that final cut, right? When we have adequate oak regeneration and it's uh, what is adequate advanced oak regeneration? I, I think that that's up to you and your forester. In the perfect world, you would have um, about 250 or 300 oak stems per acre. I mean, that would be great. But maybe you'll settle on, you've got 50 seedlings uh, per acre, seedlings and saplings. Or maybe you've only got 25 and you decide to underplant with some bare root seedlings to offset. But you, you have to play with that over time, you know, figure out what kind of regeneration am I getting, is it adequate? And when it is adequate, then you can do that final cut and release that young forest. It's, you know, you've now got an oak regenerate its stand, an even age stand. All the trees in that stand have equal opportunity at sunlight as they develop upward. The perfect scenario. What, one more quick scenario. Uh, that I wrote the forest management plan for this particular stand. It's near Galena, Illinois. Uh, and this is the description for that stand. Uh, and the dominant and co-dominant trees are red oak, white oak, bur oak, walnut, and black oak 12 to 30 inches in diameter. The mid-story trees are elm, bitternut hickory, basswood, cedar, red oak, white oak, ironwood, and black cherry 4 inches to 12 inches in diameter. And what's our current regeneration class? We've got ash, bitternut hickory, basswood, and ironwood. And actually, there were a few oak on this site. So that was encouraging, because when we go to do this shelter wood harvest, the fact that there were a few oak uh, seedlings there already uh, gives me hope that when we employ this shelter wood harvest, I mean, we're going to have a good, uh, we're going to get good results. And the shrub layer, there was no really uh, invasives to, to speak of. There weren't any honeysuckle. There weren't any buckthorn. So that was good news, something we didn't have to deal with. Uh, up front. And this particular uh, stand has a site index of 60 feet for red oak. So this is an even poorer quality site than the previous one. Again, I was, I'm really excited about that. 
that should mean that I'm going to have success if I do this right. I really am going to get oak regeneration here because it's a poor quality site. We do the things we're supposed to and we're going to outcompete the oak or going to outcompete anything else on that site. So the preparatory cut actually already took place uh, this winter. Um, the preparatory part of that shelter wood harvest already took place. A crew came in and they took out all of, you know, as I said before, all the basswood, ash, elm, cedar, the list goes on, uh, 12 inches and smaller. And they painted the stumps with garlon mixed with basil oil so that they didn't resprout. We don't want these trees resprouting and becoming a part of that even aged oak forest. We want them gone from that site. And so, you know, the goals are very much the same. Actually, I think I, uh, oh, I, one big point I forgot to point out is that we're, they're going to be conducting prescribed burns on that property. In fact, they already started before I wrote the management plan. They did the first burn, I, I don't know if it was 2009 or 10 or 11, but a while ago. But we're going to be burning it every two or three years right now, trying to prepare the seed bed for oak germination. And, uh, you know, there's still basswood around. There's still elm around. You know, that fire is going to be top killing those undesirable species and it's going to be favoring the oak, right? Setting the stage that we do get adequate oak regeneration. And so, you know, the, the goals are the same as the site before. We want to get rid of the undesirable species. We want to increase light levels by thinning out that canopy in different stages. Uh, and we, we want to begin the process of creating an even aged oak stand. And we will be using prescribed fire to prepare the seedbed. So I think that we're going to have even better luck at this site than the other site. The other site isn't going to be uh, using any prescribed fire. So it'll be interesting to see if it works or not. It could, but fire is going to really give us the edge here. And, you know, and I say we're beginning the process because eventually once we get advanced oak regeneration, adequate advanced oak regeneration, we got to make that final cut to remove the remaining oak overstory and thus release that even aged oak forest. Every tree has equal opportunity at sunlight. That's what we want. So um, I'm almost done here, but I, just as a disclaimer, you can't regenerate oak naturally if you don't have oak to begin with. So don't run out there and try to regenerate a black locust stand to oak. Obviously, it's not going to work, right? So if you've got, you know, this is a picture of a black locust thicket. You know, if you don't have any oak or you don't have enough oak and it's just, it's not going to work, don't try. You know, but if you want oak, then just do heavy site prep. You know, come in, doze out the locust or, you know, do a lot of hand work. You know, treat the stems with herbicide and you're probably going to be fighting them for a while. You know, come in there and underplant with oak. I mean, sometimes the only way to get oak back on a site is to use nursery stock. So I just wanted to say that as a sort of disclaimer. And so in conclusion, oak require a high light environment to germinate and to develop through time. Uh, use even aged forest management, clear cuts, seed tree harvest, shelter wood systems to regenerate oak. Don't use the single tree selection system, which really is what I see used most often in Northwest Illinois or even across the state. I mean, when, whenever someone's having a harvest, it seems like it's most often a single tree selection harvest. So it's, do, you know, most of the time you're doing nothing for oak regeneration if you do that. Poor growing sites are the best sites for regenerating oak, you know, especially, um, you know, if you can see, you're on a south, southwest facing aspect and you see bedrock exposed all over that aspect. I mean, the poorer the site, the better really. Uh, those are the prime oak sites that you should be targeting, if you can. You know, it depends on what you're working with. Use prescribed fire to prepare the seed bed and knock back competition and you will have much better luck. If you're not using that prescribed fire component, you, um, it might work still, it might not work as well. But it, this is just a nice tool to have. It's, 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 I wouldn't say it's essential, but it kind of is. Um, and 
lastly, be sure to eradicate exotics first. Eradicate that honeysuckle, eradicate that buckthorn before you start even doing anything else because I don't want you to come back to me and say, you know, I, I did a shelterwood harvest and I got a honeysuckle stand afterward. So I warned you. All right, any questions? Yes? In, in an even age stand, at maturity, what base solarity you wanted an oak, a full quality oak site? Probably at maturity, is somewhere between 60 and 80. You know, so you've, you might have. Well, then at harvest, at harvest, what you want? Still 60 to 80? Yeah, that's what I would be, that would be my goal. Because if you get above 80, that stands starting to get overstocked, the trees are slowing their growth if you get up over 80. And we want the trees to be at maximum growth always because that means we're going to get to harvest them faster. So I would always, my goal is to always, at maturity, keep it between 60 and 80. Basal area is a good measure for mature forests, but it's not a good measure for a young forest. A young forest, you're talking trees per acre. In a mature stand, you're talking basal area per acre. So don't let that fool you, you know. If, if somebody says, you know, I've got, I just regenerate an oak, you know, the stand is an even age stand, it's five years old, and I've got, 30 basal area per acre, it really doesn't mean that much. You're, at that point, you're, you're using the metric trees per acre. Eventually, you get to basal area. Okay, any other questions? Yes? Well, one of the problems you have when you get to that third step, you're knocking big trees down on top of all those small trees you're trying to grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would imagine you're going to have to really chop up the tops pretty hard to get it down on the ground. And the man I'm working right now is really upset the fact that he's cutting all the big oaks down, mm -hmm. you know, a thousand four feet per egg, and he's just smashing everything on the ground. Mm -hmm. it, it's just something you have to live with. It is something you have to live with, um, but I don't know. I don't really mind the treetops because they're going to provide protection for those young oak seedlings. They're gonna, it's gonna allow for protection against the deer that might be browsing them off. I actually like that mess. Um, you know, uh, it, it's advantageous for you. Um, furthermore, you know, a tree comes crashing down and it, you know, squashes that advanced oak regeneration you had, you know, that, and I talked about it earlier, you know, you, you got this nice six foot tall oak and it comes down and it squashes it. Really no big deal. Just cut it off at the ground line and it'll re-sprout vigorously. I mean, it's, yes, when you do that final step, it's gonna create a little bit of work for you, going in there looking for any oak that were damaged, but you just cut them off at the ground line and they'll re-sprout, no big deal. So, yeah, thank you. Yes? You're gonna deal with the exotic plants and the honeysuckle and all that stuff. Well, luckily, you know, on a poor site, honeysuckle and buckthorn act similarly to maple um, and basswood. They don't compete well on poor sites. You know, exotics love good quality sites. So on a poor site, hopefully the exotics won't be a real big issue or the, you know, as much of an issue as they are on good quality sites. So you've got that going for you already. Um, if you do have to deal with them, I'd, you know, I'd, come in, uh, well, you can treat them at different points in the year, but let's say you've got, you know, seven foot tall mature honeysuckle, I come in in the dorm, or in the fall rather, I cut them off at the ground line and I treat them with herbicide, and in the fall the sap's running down into the roots, it sucks that herbicide down into the roots and really does an effective job of killing that plant, and so you gotta go around and do that to each of them. And then in the spring, if some of those that you thought you killed still re-sprout, you can hit them with a foliar application uh, and, and finish them off. So, you, you, so how do you deal with them? Some hard work and some herbicide. Yes? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't think I could really hear you. Let me come a little bit closer. Oh, direct seating.
you know about any, I mean, we're talking, how is that going to work as compared to what you're doing? Do they do that anymore? Direct seeding? Yes. Okay, um, well, actually, I, I tell people that you can direct seed walnut. That does well. Um, I, I might have even learned that trick from Ralph Eads. He's sitting right there. But anyways, he, uh, I, I, it might have been him that told me this. I think it was. It, you, you collect walnut, for instance. You put them in a bin, and you put them out there, and you let the squirrels plant them around. Okay? And the squirrels are great at planting them at the right depth, and they regenerate very well. And, but of course, they'll come back and eat some but they won't come back and eat them all. But oak, I don't recommend, yeah, they were direct seeding in the 70s and the 80s and having a lot of success with it until the deer populations exploded, right? Um, and so now, I don't find that, in my experience anyways, that direct seeding works very well because the deer get them, the squirrels get them, the turkey get them, and if, if the animals don't get them, then the, um, uh, Gosh, I, I'm always talking about it too, I can't remember. It's a bug, what's it called? Oak weevil, oak acorn weevil. If the animals don't get them, the oak acorn weevil probably will. So the, the female in the fall drills into the acorn and deposits an egg. That egg hatches out as a larvae, eats its way from the inside out of that acorn. So anyways, when I walk around Northwest Illinois, a lot of times, I'm in the fall, I'm picking up acorns just to see what's going on on that site. And more often than not, it seems like, you know, I've only been in Northwest Illinois for a couple of years, so this is just based on my ex limited experience at this point. But acorn weevils are uh, a real problem. And uh, so another reason why I don't really uh, recommend direct seeding at this point, but why this system, I think, can work, especially if you use fire, is I think that the fire is going to really control those acorn weevil populations. Because, you know, it's going to kill a lot of those uh, eggs in, at the soil ground level there. And so I, I, I really do believe that fire is going to help to overcome that issue. Okay, yes? How do you control wildlife then in your self-defense? Just to be described up here, you know, from deer and stuff, from mm -hmm. throwing your own. Well, like I said, I think that um, naturally regenerated oak do much better against deer than planted oak do. And in, in this area of the state, uh, I mean, mostly when people go to regenerate oak, they plant it from nursery stock and it gets hammered. And so we're used to thinking that if, if we have a young oak tree, it's going to get hammered by deer. But natural regeneration, and if you... I, I think it, hand, it, it stands up better. They're not as interested in it. And under these systems, if you're doing what you're supposed to, hopefully you're getting a lot of regeneration and you're overwhelming them anyway. Okay, so yes, you might have to give away a few, but they can't get them all. So that's the, process, the thought process. Yes? What other factors go into this site? Um, well, I mean, soil quality, and, you know, I, I'm not a soil scientist, but somebody figured out, you know, in a certain type of soil, typically, how tall will this tree be after 50 years in this soil? So it's all hinges on uh, soil quality. So in northwest Illinois, um, the best growing soil for in, in a woodland scenario is the Fayette soils. And uh, the site index for oak on, the, the, on that type of soil is going to be 80 after 50 years. And so some, I don't know, somebody figured out that, you know, on a Fayette soil, a red oak is going to be 80 feet on average after 50 years. And on these poor so, uh, quality soils, it's going to be 60 feet. I don't know how they did it. <laughs> some smart soil scientist. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Some of your pictures there, Lauren, when you're talking about the clear cut or the cut or whatever. Uh -huh. It always looked like it was kind of a level site, you know. And so you mm -hmm. talk about your lesser quality soils, your Fayette soils. Lots of times the topography there is pretty steep, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so you do a clear cut on that. I'm afraid of erosion. Yeah, well, I, then I probably wouldn't clear cut if you, if it's a highly erodible site. I'd do a shelter wood system because if you take it off in three stages, you're getting flush 
flushes of growth in between. You're not, you know, you're not taking all those trees off at once and you're stabilizing those soils with the flushes of growth you get in between those cuts, those overstory cuts. And it, and it, it should stabilize your soil. Because I agree, if you, if, you, know, you just go and clear cut every darn tree out of there, you, you could have some soil erosion issues, but you're controlling it through the shelter wood harvest system. So the reason land is in timber because the, the good timber on top soil, that's already been cleared for crack ground. Mm -hmm. The reason why the topography is rolling or steep or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But you got to think, I mean, before we got here, there was 14 million acres of, of timber and there were a lot of disturbances going on. Native Americans were burning the heck out of it. Uh, there were ice storms. There were the uh, wind throw, you know, I mean, so th these steep soils, I mean, you know, even if we don't clear cut them, nature might. So, you know, my thought is let's not let nature clear cut it. Let's take control of the situation, employ a shelter wood harvest, do it in stages and we, we should be able to stabilize the soil that way and not get a whole lot of uh, soil loss. All right, any other questions? All right. Thank you.